Hey, what's up, everyone? For this video, I want to talk about the book that just recently came out. It's really kind of captivated me, and I'm just I've I haven't been stop I haven't stopped thinking about it for the last couple of weeks. So, I, you know, on my on my flight home from California, I decided to pick up a uh, a copy of the New Slam magazine, and they had a whole article about this book. And uh, this book is about uh, you know a former NBA player named uh, Chris Heron. He was at, actually out of the Boston area, uh, arguably the best player to ever come out of Fall River, Massachusetts. He was actually drafted by the Denver Nuggets in 1999, and then in uh, the, the following year, he was traded to the Boston Celtics, so he got an opportunity to play in his hometown. You know, he grew up a Celtic fan, so it was pretty much like a tailor-made story, you know. Um, but, you know, this guy basically blew everything away on drugs. It really, like, you know, he just, you know, pissed everything away. The guy the guy was pretty good, you know. He was he was 6'2", white, uh, a pretty good point guard. You know, the, the, the former announcer for the Boston Celtics, Tommy Heinsohn, you know, the old time announcer for that team said he was uh, he, he'd never seen anyone run the offense that well since Bob Cousy, which is a hell of a compliment, you know, and um, Rick Pitino was high on him, gave him great compliments when Rick Pitino used to coach the Boston Celtics. So, I mean, the kid had a lot of potential, but he pissed it all away. Do the drugs. I mean, this kid took, uh, you know, started out as an alcoholic when he was young in college. Then, you know, some some people offered him at Boston University, you know, a college couple offered him crack. They pushed it on, pushed it on him, and eventually he took it. Once he did take it, he became addicted, stopped going to class, you know, wasn't going. I mean, his basketball habits got worse. I mean, he basically just blew it. So, you know, his Boston University didn't work out. You know, he did get a second chance. Jerry Tarkanian, the former coach of the UNLV Rebels at the time, late 97, around 97, 98, late 90s. He started coaching at Fresno State. Um, Ray Ralston, you know, from the Orlando Magic, he, he played at Fresno State as well during that time. Skip to my loot, the Adam one, the Adam one dude, a lot of you guys might remember him. Uh, so, yeah, you know, uh, Chris Chris Heron uh, turned his life around at Fresno State, his career around a little bit. You know, he was he still had the addiction problem, but it wasn't as bad. He was under control. You know, Jerry Tarkanian was the kind of coach that tried to, you know, give players a second chance. He, he he really recruited, you know, badasses, rebels, you know, guys that have behavior problems and try to give them, you know, a second chance in life. So, you know, he, at Fresno State, he played great. You know, I mean, obviously, they didn't, they didn't win the NCAA tournament or anything like that. They got to the NIT a couple of times, but he was good enough to make the NBA. You know, he just he just barely made it. I think he was the uh, 33rd pick in the 99 NBA draft uh, by the Denver Nuggets. So, I mean, he did pretty well for himself. He had some good workouts uh, during the pre-draft camps. So, you know, everything was cool at, at the time, you know, um, with the Nuggets, you know, he was away from, you know, he was with a lot of veterans, so he didn't really have exposure to get drugs. But then when he was traded to the Celtics uh, the very next year, he really, um, you know, things like really, really got worse again, you know, because, you know, let me just read you this quote from the book. When he got traded back to the Celtics, he said, when I got traded to the Celtics, I was happy for all the wrong reasons. I wasn't happy because I was back home and had grown up idolizing the Celtics when I was a kid. I was happy because I was back home and I knew where to get the drugs. I also had the money to buy them. It was a deadly combination. So, you know, I mean, there was even a time when he was, you know, buying, you know, heroin or crack or whatever it was or Oxycontin while he had his Celtics warm-ups on. I mean, it, it's it's a pretty sad story, um, you know, because this kid had potential, you know, he, he blew it all away, you know. At, at, like I said, at first he was, you know, hooked on crack, uh, and then it turned to um, Oxycontin. You know, Oxycontin, you know, that's the type of thing that, you know, you give cancer patients or AIDS patients, you know, just to get through the pain, and this guy was taking them every single day. Uh, and then from, from there, you know, obviously, you know, the drug problems surfaced. I, I don't think anyone really, you know, I don't think a lot of people knew about the drug problems while he was in the NBA. I mean, he I, a lot of people thought he was like on the road to recovery because when he was in college, it was, you know, all over the news. It really, really just, you know, became a national story. This kid had a bad reputation. All right. So uh, Chris Heron was, you know, he was weighed by the Boston Celtics, obviously. So, you know, the next step after getting cut from an NBA team, uh, obviously, you know, the logical step is to look for a job overseas. Now, overseas, they pay pretty good money, you know, especially back then. I think he was making like 20000 to 50000 a month. So he had, I mean, the, the money was still pretty good. You know, it was pretty, he was pretty much just making as much as he was in the NBA. But, you know, I think, um, I think a situation happened, or obviously a situation happened, if you read about it in the book, where um, he was actually playing in Italy and the team actually decided to go to a training camp up in the mountains. And uh, he didn't want to go because obviously if he went, he wouldn't have, you know, 
any way to get his drugs, to get the Oxycontin. There was, he was going to be screwed. He was going to get sick. So he actually, because of the drug problem, he had to quit the team, turn all that money down. He had a wife and a kid with him, and they had to go back to Boston. Then he tried to get back on the Celtics. Got, you know, actually, initially he made the team, and then he got waived again. So, um, yeah, it's just unfortunate, man. I think, you know, I, I think this is just a situation of someone that really, you know, loved basketball. I think he really did. He obviously was a hard worker. He was only 6'2". You know, for for you know a white kid to make it to the NBA while being only six foot two, I think it says a lot. You know, I, I, obviously you had to be very very talented to get to that level. Um, but you know, I, I think you know this is just a case where the pressure just got too much for him. I, it seemed like his senior year of high school when you know people started you know having these high expectations for him, and you know obviously I think his father put a lot of pressure on him. You know, there was a, a large a big expectation he had to live up to his brother because his brother was a very good player as well. And, uh, you know, some people just, I don't know, it's just some people just don't, you know, want that pressure, you know. And, uh, you know, it, it, they try to look for a way out, you know, the way to just escape all the anxieties and all the stress. And I, I guess the way out for him is drugs. And, um, but, you know, this guy is still alive. He, in 2008, he hit rock bottom. He almost died um, in a car accident because he overdosed on something. But, um he went to a rehab center and he's still he's still doing pretty well today i, I mean I don't, i'm not so sure i don't know if you can really trust a guy like this it seems like this guy really you know went through hell and back um but you know i just want if this guy ever listens to this video i just want to say um i think he has a lot to be proud of you know um the fact that he did make it to the nba i think you know it, it does mean a lot you know because some people dedicate their life to basketball and don't even come close to making it to the NBA. You know, I didn't come close. I mean, I mean, I only got to the, I played some of division two basketball. Didn't turn out that good. You know, I had a mediocre season the one year I did play. Um, so I didn't come close to making it to the NBA and this guy did. So, um, just think he, I, I just think he deserves, you know, some credit for that, you know, even though, you know, most people would say his career has been disappointing and it was totally ruined by drugs because he did have potential though i mean you, you see some of the some of the quotes that you know some of the you know former great coaches have said about him um this kid definitely did have potential and he and he pissed it all away because of drugs and you know i i think i think you know everyone needs to relieve stress in some form or fashion you know, for me, you know, it was entertainment. You know, wrestling was one of the things I, I turned to, you know, just watching wrestling. That was like, I didn't turn to drugs and I never really got into it. I was always afraid of it. You know, I was always afraid it would poison my love for the game. But, you know, one thing about wrestling was it just, the reason I started watching it was just, it just, at the time, 2001 was when I got back into it. And it just, it was such an escape from reality. I just got so into it because of that, you know. It just it just took me away from all the stress from about about you know dealing with coaches and dealing with you know uh, you know other players you know trying to take your spot and blah 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 so many I mean there's 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 more to basketball than just you know trying to work out stay in shape and practice it's a lot more than that you know you I really think you need to have you know social skills and it goes even beyond that you know there's there's a lot of politics go into it as well and um you know some some people just don't have the personality to deal with that stuff and i think this guy was one of them but you know i give this guy credit though because he was good as hell I, obviously to get to that level you have to be great and from what i've heard this guy absolutely was great but um uh, this is just a perfect example of how an nba career was ruined by drugs i just wanted to share this story with you guys uh hopefully you enjoyed it um once again, the book is called Basketball Junkie. It's by Chris Herring. So um, there we go.